was growing up, I had a subtle sense that I was not quite good enough. It wasn't really something that I was aware of consciously, for children assume that the message they receive from parents and other persons and institutions of authority are correct. Don't get me wrong. I was raised by loving parents who loved each other and served the church and God with humility and dedication. But you see, despite that, I remember feeling as a child through adolescence that there was something about me that was somehow less. And the result influenced my belief in my abilities and full potential. Then my dad came to me at some point in my later youth or young adult years and expressed to me that he knew he had not been outwardly affectionate and that it had been difficult for him to verbally, freely express his love and affection. He had come to that insight about himself and he came to me to express his remorse and pain, along with his concern and awareness of its consequence. He himself had been raised without a comfortable showing of affection and voiced love, and he had to learn to be comfortable. Somehow it had still been difficult with his young children. It all came together for me because my father was and always has been one of my greatest mentors, a man of great integrity, one that I turned to for advice. I knew that he loved me as a result of his attention and care and concern, always. But it would have been nice, as a little girl, to experience it more tangibly. Today, we are affectionate in touch and word. I am currently going to some therapy sessions with my 25-year-old daughter. Our family therapist is an amazing woman who has been a periodic part of our family life journey in the past 14 years with her professional assistance. With my daughter's permission, I share, she has uncovered feelings that were articulated in much the same way that mine were, feelings she is realizing that she had growing up and she is, in fact, still aware of, a feeling of being less than, different, and somehow not fitting in with the family. These seem in part related to a mixture of her personality type and her deep bond and kinship with my first husband, Steve, her dad, who died when she was 15. We're still taking it apart. Working with her and encouraging her in this is one of my strongest commitments in this season of my family life. Now, what do these very personal witnesses have to do with a sermon on reconciliation. Let me weave the messages together. These two stories are about things that come up in the best of circumstances. A Christian middle-class family with parents who love each other, who are dedicated to their children, an atmosphere and environment of integrity and service. And still, stuff comes up. Stuff that we have to deal with stuff that we were and are able to deal with due to the care and concern of our loved ones, and the additional benefit and ability to seek professional help in order to do it more thoroughly. We are blessed in that we can take these normal feelings like all humans carry and bring them to healing and insight, even gaining strength from that insight. But what happens when the stuff that comes up is more like this? Growing up through the phases of life, family, friends, school, church, the assumptions, the messages about who you are, who you will become, whom you will love and marry are completely contrary to what you feel inside. What is it like to be an adolescent coming to terms with intimate relationship and sexuality when the predominant expectation is heterosexuality, of attraction to the opposite sex, and creating life together? What is it like to be gay in a world that assumes straight is normal? What kind of stuff does that bring about? 
As my beginning stories remind us, in the best of circumstances, everyday life and relationships give us plenty of opportunities to experience pain and insecurity. But for those who receive the continual message that they, their very being is wrong and incompatible with God's creation, life place becomes a choice. A choice to be real and risk rejection, or a choice to hide and pretend in order to fit in with the predominant expectation. Neither offer wholeness or fullness in God's creation. For some, there is a much more severe result from the internalization that gay is not good, and that is to embrace the notion that one's personhood is entirely not good. That is what is happening to too many in our world. Each one is one too many. My brother Mike, who is gay, left the United Methodist Church over 20 years ago. He had a long journey attempting to figure out if he could be heterosexual. His esteem is intact enough to declare who he is with pride, and while he has been embraced by his family, he has no interest in committing to an organization with an official declaration that his lifestyle is incompatible with Christian teaching. But there are other stories happening every day. All we need to do is pay attention. One of the latest is Jamie Rodemeyer, a 14-year-old boy from Williamsville, New York, who took his life in late September after years of bullying because of the struggles with his sexuality. Unless we are gay, we don't really get it. But we can listen to the stories. We can learn and strive to understand. We can respond. All of us get some part about the feeling that we are not good enough and somehow we can't quite fit into a number of places or with certain people. It's just the way life is. But if we can honestly enter that place for a moment and really allow ourselves to enter that insecure zone we avoid so well, it is helpful in appreciating why we must, as Christian brothers and sisters in such a time as this, declare our body one that is reconciling. Surely it is important to, vote, to devote part of this message to the specifics leading to the place where we are today, three weeks from that decision. To assist you in understanding what we are talking about in regard to being a reconciling church, I offer this. A reconciling committee was established to explore the implications of such a designation and to help educate our congregation as to what this would mean should our church adopt such a position. In May of this year, our church council endorsed a statement in support of our congregation becoming a reconciling congregation. A full church meeting will be held on October 23rd, and this is called a church conference. This will be one of the most historically important meetings of our church. Every member present will have a vote. Our process over several years has involved a number of classes, Bible studies, witnesses, seminars, a special video, and sermons by each of the clergy and guest Bishop Jack Toole. We are also aware not all have been able to participate and may not yet have been a part of this community. We are aware that at any time we discern we are ready for this decision, there will be some who feel there has not been enough opportunity for education and preparation. United Methodist congregations across the connection are deciding to join Reconciling Ministries Network. Check out rmn.org by officially declaring themselves Reconciling Congregations, and currently there are 10 in our own conference. The action to do so is not contrary to the Book of Discipline, and we are a congregation committed to many social justice ministries. Here is the statement 
that we would embrace with our votes. We at Pasadena First United Methodist Church are a Christian community seeking intentionally to welcome all persons, regardless of sexual orientation, gender, race, ethnicity, age, physical or mental capacity, education, and socioeconomic or marital status. We practice God's ministry of reconciliation through worship, devotion, compassion, and justice for all who we have known, who have known the pain of exclusion and discrimination. Our greatest challenge and our only hope is to receive and share God's all-encompassing love. The intentional aspect of this welcome is key and would appear in our primary means of communication. Without it, for many, ambiguity lives and the assumption that we may well be in judgment otherwise. This is an opportunity for us to be clear in the midst of a culture where the prevailing assumption for many remains that mainline Protestant churches, or for that matter, Christians, believe that the LGBT community is somehow less. This is a time that we can fill the space of wondering with a clear invitation to this large community of people who still journey through life wondering who is judging. A place where they can be safe and for whom in many cases their family has rejected or given varying degrees of judgment and disappointment. We can be family together. We are the church continuing to do our very best to interpret Christ and God in our world to bring the good news to a hurting world. Dr. Frank Trotter's post on Facebook yesterday with his strong clarification that it is totally unrelated to his incapacity leave is another call for the urgency of our reconciliation stance. With his permission, I quote, I want all of you to know that I am a gay man. My family, close career friends, and other sojourners along the road know this, but I want all of you to know it and hear it. This is how God made me, and the me that God made is the same one that God called to ordained ministry. God has been with me on every step of what has often been a painful walk. Being unable to acknowledge who one is as a child of God is a requirement for ministry that I pray the church and society will soon move beyond. If my honesty offends any of you, I humbly ask for forgiveness and that you would understand the reasons for my silence. If my honesty leads you to rejoice with me, I give God thanks that I have been able to make this announcement at last. Dr. Trotter is one of many gay clergy in the United Methodist Church who are asked to hide their sexual orientation or expose themselves to great risk. While we do not have the power to change the wording of the Book of Discipline, we do have the power to make this declaration about who we are and whom we intentionally welcome and embrace at First United Methodist Church Pasadena. The gospel message for each and every one of us today on this World Communion Sunday is not just about our declared statement as a church on reconciliation but that our God through Christ delivers a miraculous and profound response to all of our individual places of unworthiness and insecurity, to all of our places of guilt and burden, to all of our souls yet to be forgiven. The portions of Paul's letters to the Philippians and Ephesians in our scripture today remind us Our righteousness comes not from the law, but through faith in God, the righteousness from God based on faith. We can know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, attaining the resurrection from the dead. 
Resurrecting the dead places in this life invites us to bring new life and truth to the false messages we have received, feeding our unworthiness. Paul continues, Not that we have already obtained this or have already reached this goal, but we press on to make it our own because Christ Jesus has made us his own. This one thing we can do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, we press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. For we are no longer strangers and aliens, despite the way we may internalize these messages through life, I would add, but citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. May we all take the time to pray and discern what it is that God wants us to do in our own lives and in this congregation. Thanks be to God, who embraces each of us in this holy place, at this holy time, in our holy struggle. Amen.